One of the wonderful things about specimens such as Nereocotome is that they give us a window into the life history development of fossil taxa. It's nice to have adults because adults give us sort of a final phenotypic picture of a lineage and they allow us to make comparisons of that adult form. However, having juvenile specimens such as Nereocotome or such as the Demonisi specimen which we'll talk about in a few short segments give us a window into changes in during growth and development and that process of growth and development. Recall that across primates, there's many shared patterns of development in terms of the timing of childhood, the relative importance of it in primates, and its association with development. But humans in particular have an extended pattern of development. This is one of the critical evolutionary traits, derived traits, that gave rise to us. So understanding when, in the context of the fossil record, this extended pattern of development, this prioritization of development, first appeared is very important. And to have juvenile specimens such as these, or such as the earlier Australopithecine specimen from Dikika, give us a window into that process. Now when we look at the Nereocotome specimen, or the related Demonisi specimen, these are young teenagers, perhaps a little bit even younger than that, maybe 10 to 11 or 12 in age, and so they represent a, a, a certain time period in the life of these individuals, but also a certain time period in terms of the development of human life history. These are specimens that are just prior to when we might expect to see an adolescent growth spurt. And again, Nereocotome is a very tall individual, even if he hasn't already gone through a growth spurt. So depending on how much of a growth spurt, again, we might expect this to be a six-foot individual, a very tall individual. But again, the prioritization or the timing of these life history events is important for what exactly is going on. So in specimens such as the Demonisi and Nereocotome specimens, we see evidence of these later adolescent growth processes and perhaps evidence of adolescent growth spurts and that timing and importance of large adult body size. But earlier events are also important. Recall the Dakika individual or the Tong child individual are just juvenile specimens, even younger in age. And what they give us a window on is potentially changes that are there at birth. For example, one of the most important human characteristics is, of course, our larger brain size. And that larger brain size isn't solely the product of an extended period of growth. Beginning even with Australopithecines, we have some evidence that Australopithecines were giving birth to slightly larger brained infants than comparative samples such as chimpanzees. So already in Australopithecines, there might have been a slight prioritization of brain size at birth. Now, larger brain size at birth may have changed the dynamics of childhood and infant development in Australopithecines, maybe setting the stage for the subsequent cognitive revolution that we see with the origin of the genus Homo. By the time we get to Homo erectus, we see further evidence perhaps of slightly increased brain size at birth. So Nereocotome's larger brain isn't simply a product of growing faster or growing over a longer period of time, but also having a larger brain at birth. Again, an evolutionary change associated with the earliest process of development. Now, this relatively large brain at birth corresponds also to probably a relatively larger infant at birth. Again, Australopithecines have been reconstructed to have relatively large infants at birth relative to other kinds of apes. This is a product of reconstructions of neonatal brain size and neonatal body size and comparisons to estimates of adult body size. Now again, this is evidence of prioritization of childhood, prioritization of growth potential. Having relatively large babies in humans is largely a product of them having slightly larger brains and also being relatively fat heavy. Recall that one of the soft tissue differences between humans and other primates is that we tend to carry a lot of fat, especially as children and as very young children. This fat that we carry as young children has been described by some anthropologists as brain information. We use those fat reserves during early childhood development to not only have a larger brain at birth, but to grow our brain more rapidly after birth. It's an energy reserve that can be drawn upon to feed the tremendous energetic needs of a large growing brain. So already in Australopithecines, we see some evidence, even if their adult brain size is not much larger than adult chimpanzee or ape size, of a prioritization of development during childhood. Slightly larger brains at birth, slightly larger body size at birth. By the time we get to Homo erectus, we're beginning to see that process accelerate even more. Again, even larger brains at birth, even more extended periods of growth, and perhaps even larger infants at birth. And again, larger infants at birth not only tell us something about childhood, but tell us about processes of birth as well, and the social care needed to successfully achieve those births. The perhaps aloe parenting necessary to assist in carrying around a baby while still maintaining a hunter-gatherer lifestyle. 
In many respects, however, the developmental pattern that we see in specimens, such as those from Demonisi and Nericotome, these early Homo erectus specimens, are similar to what we see in living humans today. In terms of the pattern of skeletal formation, when different skeletal elements fuse, representing final growth, when different dentition erupt, representing final dental eruption sequences, are for the most part very, very similar to what we see in living humans. So although there's still a lot of brain potential or brain difference between what we see in these early Homo erectus and what we have today, much of the basic developmental pattern, including prioritization of early growth, including the overall formation of skeletal morphology, is already present in Homo erectus. So these juvenile specimens give us a tremendous window into these important life history processes, processes of growth and development which tell us about evolutionary prioritization, where are we putting our energetic resources, in this case in brain and early growth and development.